Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Summer Cento Estojo. Um, kicking off today is uh, Fabian and Niels, who will be talking about uh, the future of CI infrastructure. Um, as a reminder, we do have the chat and the Q&A on the right, so you can use that to, to ask questions throughout the day. Uh, we're getting a little bit of a late start today, but we're going to make this work. Uh, Fabian and Niels, thanks, uh, thanks for presenting with us today, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Sean. Um, so let's start with um, who are we? I guess that some people know who we are, but um, I'm mainly system administrator for the CentOS Infra for several years now. And uh, Niels, can you introduce yourself? If you can unmute your microphone. <laughs> too many, too many unmute buttons. Can you hear me now? We can. Ah, okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm Niels Philipsen. I'm an engineer with Red Hat for uh, almost too long, um, 20 plus years, something. So I'm in CP for a couple of, couple of years now, uh, since 2019. Um, and my uh, yeah, my, la my latest uh, latest project was um, re-implementing re Duffy, like the um, previous version that we that we had was like people had all kinds of grief with that the people operating it the people using it and um, so like a, a team of engineers was put to that in end of 2021 um, of which I was part and yeah now we are presenting that so. So indeed, this is what we'll cover today. Um, so if you are not familiar with the Center CI Infra, it's something that is available for the, mainly for the special interest group in the Center's ecosystem, but some upstream projects started to use and abuse it uh, to validate their builds and did some integration testing. So we'll cover um, what we have and why we'll migrate because the mail was sent um, earlier this week um, to the CI user list and to the Center's level list. So it's not only about the Duffy version three um, uh, itself. It's, it will be part of the move, of the migration, and this will cover the new the new feature in Duffy. Uh, we'll cover basically how we'll migrate, which what is what is our plan to migrate the infra, and what are the benefits for Centos Fedora mainly and all the other projects uh, consuming that uh, um, uh, infrastructure basically. So just a little bit of his story. When we joined, when the CentOS project joined Red Hat, um, we had some sponsored machine just to run some CI tests, uh, mainly for the special test group. So it all started with cbs.center.org, uh, so the Koji build environment. And um, it started really small, um, just a um, centralized and shared Jenkins instance and some Jenkins virtual machines acting as workspace and a Jenkins agent. Uh, to run some tests. Uh, we started to deploy some uh, x86-64 machine mainly, initially. Um, this is basically still the same infra that we are still running today and that will uh, and that will migrate. And we started with just CentOS 6 and then CentOS 7, CentOS 8, CentOS 8 stream, and CentOS 9 stream. And slowly, we also added more architecture like ARM64 and PPC64 and PPC64 LE. Um, but it started in 2014, so clearly um, the hardware is aging at the moment. Uh, it's all out of warranty, and we suffer from more and more hardware issues on this machine. So the reason why we have to migrate um, is if you are interacting with uh, the CI Infra, you know that your job are talking to an API services called Duffy, um, which had version 1 and version 2. Version 2 is the actual one, which is uh, written in Python 2. And clearly, uh, it's it was time to, to let it go and move to something else uh, that would be refreshed and modernized and not adding Duffy version 2 in our existing tech debt. So that's region number one. Uh, so the first component that I had to change. The reason number two why we had to also consider moving away from the existing infra, which is running for now almost eight years, um, is 
the C micro. So the machine that we had in the past, so sponsored both by a C micro, then acquired by AMD, and uh, and Red Hat was a bunch of C micro chassis that we got from internally or even other project that uh, couldn't really use that uh, this kind of C micro chassis. That brand doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was quite interesting. Um, it was in 7U, you got 64 compute nodes, so 64 bare metal machine running in a kind of fabric mode. This is what we were using and ending over to the CI project when they're ask, they were asking the machine to run their test. And so the machine were installed. So this is coming from the actual um, Duffy database, a MySQL database uh, for Duffy version two. And yes, that number means more than 1.5 million physical installation with kickstart. So with a bunch of center six, seven, eight, eight stream, and then nine stream. And clearly on the machine that is running 24 seven and acting on some PR, uh, triggering some job in Jenkins, that's quite a lot. And we start to suffer from really um, hardware issue on this machine. So bye-bye um, uh, for the C micro machine, they will go away. Uh, we need to find a replacement. So the question was um, trying to find a replacement for this kind of workload. And initially we wanted to provide our bare metal instance because we had some special interest group like the cloud SIG testing really deployment of OpenStack. And so um, it was not just unit tests, but really integration tests. So deploying RDO, a full uh, over cloud and under cloud environment. So they needed bare metal just to deploy OpenStack and then virtual machine on top uh, as cloud image to see that it was working. But for majority of the tests, they don't require bare metal instance and it could be just unit tests run in a single VM, a single instance. So we came initially with the idea of using an on-premises cloud. Um, but then we uh, were aware of new constraints suddenly into the mix which is, which uh, main reason is that maybe we'll have to migrate from where we are. So um, the CentOS um, CI infra is hosted in one of the Red Hat DC, which is called Common ZKH. Uh, some of you are familiar with that world because it's where also Fedora, some machines, Ceph, Gluster, um, uh, OSPO, so OSCI.io, et cetera, they have their machine. And it can be that we'll have to really reduce our, um, our uh, space consumption and power and even move from there to um, reduce capacity. So with all that in mind, the fact that the fee at the, so at the software side had to be uh, adapted to modern, so Python 3 um, requirement, that will probably move um, to, will not have the same capacity in hardware um, and that existing hardware had to be really refreshed. We were considering, um, Embracing the, the mantra, which is now the hybrid cloud strategy. Uh, everybody's talking about hybrid cloud, so let's let's also embrace that strategy. So what we'll do is uh, we'll migrate um, the ephemeral machine that you as special interest group and CI tenants are using. So x86-64 and ARM-64 machine. Uh, we'll move that to the cloud. Um, there is one thing that will keep on-premise uh, premises a uh, uh, kind of cloud environment. That's Power 8 and Power 9 box, so PB64 LE, because uh, at the moment, um, well, it's not really common to find these uh, in a cloud market. Um, and the one that will be uh, migrating to doesn't offer PB64 LE either. So we'll do um, a kind of um, hybrid cloud strategy. Um, we have also an artifact box, so where um, CI talent and project can just uh, put their artifacts coming from uh, Jenkins tests or CI tests. It's not uh, Jenkins all the time um, on an ephemeral box so that they can retrieve that uh, logs, packages, uh, ISO image, whatever for a limited time, uh, but exposed to the outside world. We'll migrate that services um, and uh, also open shift because we have a bare metal install of OpenShift also in the actual community cage, so in the existing CI infra, and that one will also move. So that means that almost everything will move to the cloud. So this is how it will look like in the future. Um, normally the slide will be available online and happy to discuss all details later, but what will keep on-premises, so on the left side is 
Power 9, a mix of Power 9 box and Power 8 box to offer PPC64 LE uh, cloud images for testing. And these ones support nested vert in case some people would like to do um, uh, like RDO, they wanted to test a uh, cloud image, you can, they support nested virtualization. Uh, the DeFi API services will remain um, where it is at the moment. And everything else will move to AWS. Thanks for Amazon for being a sponsor for the CentOS and Fedora project. We'll have a dedicated VPC, so virtual private cloud in place, which is already configured and available. And Duffy will start deploying um, the x86 and ARM64 machine in that VPC. Same thing for the artifact box, it will move to uh, AC2. Uh, and uh, we have already a root 53 uh, dedicated internal private zone called pool.ci.centerlog. And we have also the, the resolver back and forth working for everything internal and um, in AC2 through a VPN internal, which is already up and running. So everything, all the components, except OpenShift, all the components are already working. Um, if um, some people are wondering about x864 and ARM64, because I mentioned nested virtualization for power, they would come probably with a question about, wait a minute, what about nested virtualization? Because it's a VM in AC2, so it doesn't work. Correct. Reason why we'll abuse also the metal option from uh, AWS, so there will be a pool where you can, on purpose, request a bare metal instance in AC2 uh, instead of just um, a virtual machine and a cloud image and a cloud instance. But that will be, of course, limited because, yeah, region and resource constraint. But that will be a, a possibility. For OpenShift, um, uh, it's actually being tested to redeploy a second cluster, so one in AWS. And then Tenant will have the opportunity to move from one to the other. Uh, I will explain later in some slide how we will proceed in some phase, but let's start with um, Duffy version three. So Niels, the stage is yours. All right, so uh, what I'm talking about is like that's, that small box to the left of the previous slide um, what uh, that was labeled uh, with Duffy API. So what we did is essentially uh, re-implement uh, the Duffy service from scratch. Like we, we looked at the old thing, um, uh, like analyzed the, the method of how people worked with it and um, like did everything new. Um, so next slide, please. So one new thing is that like one of the new features is that you can uh, request different types of nodes in run in 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 one go. So, say you need one beefy machine that acts as a server and a couple a couple of smaller ones to to act as the clients in your tests. You can do that in one go. You don't have to like request the one and then the other, and one of them fails, and then you have uh, then you would have to like resolve that uh, that error mode on on your end. Um, next bullet point, I guess. Uh, it supports different provisioning systems side by side. So the previous one that was tailored to the C micro uh, boxes that uh, Fabio described previously. Um, this one, you can put it like at, at a cloud, like uh, a cloud service like AWS or whatever you can uh, put it against a um, system like Open Nebula that deploys virtual machines on your own uh, hardware, or even the C micro boxes like we we tested against them. They still work as long as they work. Uh, next point, please. So the new uh, Duffy has a uh, has a like more. Uh, I, I would say a cl cleaner CRUD REST API than the previous one that looked like a REST API if you squinted. Uh, this one should be closer to that paradigm. And uh, due to the technology stack we use, it has uh, it's essentially self-documenting. There's online documentation you can point your browser to and try out the API um, directly. Uh, next bullet, please. And uh, for 
all existing users of uh, of Duffy, there's a meta client service which exposes the the old API and uh, translates that into requests that that it puts against the new API and translates back and forth the requests and responses. Uh, next one, please. So the biggest noticeable difference in Duffy uh, version three is uh, that it actually doesn't know about the properties of the nodes it manages. Like it doesn't know a node is, a, a, say, an x86-64 machine or that it has uh, big storage, small storage, uh, or that it's installed with Fedora 36 or CentOS 9 stream. Uh, it only knows about like a pool that a node belongs to. Like um, it puts nodes of, with, with the same qualities in, in uh, the same name pool. And the, the knowledge about these things that lives in, in the uh, deployment Ansible playbooks. Next slide, please. So here are the different components, like the one box on, on Fabia's last slide, uh, that's actually these, uh, these items in, in bold, plus the Postgres database. Uh, like, uh, let, no, um, let's put it this way. It's, it's everything from about uh, like the, the, the middle of the page downwards. Like the it's the CRUD REST API, the legacy meta, meta client task workers, and the database playbooks and and that stuff. Like the the stuff to the top of the page, the Duffy client CLI or the legacy API clients. That's what what you use in in your environment to talk to uh, to talk to Duffy. And that's like is essentially we can put them. We could put them all all of these items in in, in on different nodes, but it's just too lightweight to do that. So it's usually everything in one place. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, how it would like look like from a command line to run one of your sessions, like the the first line uh, the first line uh, requests one node of a certain pool that's named F thirty six X eighty six sixty four. That doesn't mean anything to Duffy. It's just it's it's just a name. Um, it usually means like the, the, uh, means something to to the people operating the service and the people using it. So, and um, like it it gives you an output that you can just pipe into into a, a, a while loop uh, to process it. Then you do something with the number of nodes you requested and. Uh, when, when you're done with that, you just retire the session that's identified by an, uh, a number. And then you're done. And then there's some some stuff in the background that that kicks off, kicks off to reclaim either the hardware. In the, in the case of a bare metal machine, like the, the um, previous system, these nodes still exist. So you have to do something about them. So it would... Um, clean them out and um, like install them anew with whatever is required at that point. Uh, for virtual machines or for, for cloud nodes, it will just deallocate the, the resources and um, the, everything from then on is just, just an old stale entry in the database. Uh, next slide, please. So behind the scenes, this was a project, the development project was started in Q4 20. 21 uh, extended into Q1 2022 and other than myself uh, it was these uh, three people working with me Akash uh, Dida, Ben Kappa and Vibble Siddharth you might know them from uh, from the commun community I guess uh, next bullet point please so uh, contrary to the old one, which was uh, like, um, if I got like Vipple was our was our um, was our go go to expert for how things were are with the with the old version. So it it was um, 
as far as I understood, it was was hard to deploy changes. So there was a lot of hot fixes going on. Uh, the new version has an actively maintained dependency stack, like the dependencies we chose, they appear to be actively maintained. Like every every couple of days, we we get a new set of set of updated versions, which we integrate and uh, test with. So um, like that's, I mean, um, I could read the names, but that would be just name dropping at this point. The code base is fully tested. So every time we do changes, we run the whole suit. We at least know that every line of the code was touched once with a couple of exceptions, uh, just um, if they're like very, um, that would be like very exotic code paths, which are, which are hard to replicate in the testing environment. So next point, it's installable from PyPy. Like it's also easy to, contrary to the old one, it's easy to make a new version. I just, just did it a couple hours ago. So um, you can just pip install Duffy and then you would have to choose a couple. There are a couple of different, different ex, uh, Python package ex, extras defined. Like you have the, the client CLI tool, which is probably what tenants are interested in. You have also uh, the task workers, um, the uh, legacy meta client, which you can install uh, install as extra, so you don't have to pull in the whole set of dependencies, but just the dependencies you need to do your work. And next one, please. I guess the last one. Uh, code re repository lives in the centers organization on, on GitHub. Um, that's where we keep our um, issues, pull requests. So um, if you want to participate, if you bump into anything, um, please open the ticket there. I'd appreciate that. And I think that's it from me. Thank you, Nils. And if you have questions, don't forget to use the Q&A section or maybe just the all-way track discussion after. So back to the infra itself. Um, um we as if you are subscribed to the ci user list and if, if you are a tenant maybe you are and you received the mail already last wednesday um we'll start with phase one which is deploy version three of duffy on a new machine um but it will be transparent operation well more or less transparent operation in a sense that we'll keep the legacy endpoints uh available that uh, Nils explained the only thing that you have to do is opt-in so this is a required operation so that we can just really do a kind of it's springtime cleaning uh, spring cleaning time or something like that just to ensure that we just onboard the tenant who really want to move um, but the api key will not change nothing will change and at the back duffy will just end over exactly the same kind of machine you had before so c micro uh, as a start but the new duffy api endpoint will be available and you can start uh, ad, uh, testing it and adapt your CI workflow to the new one. So, but worst case in, in August, uh, there will just be a small maintenance window when we'll just move from one to the other, but uh, it should be transparent. Then phase two, uh, which we target uh, for October, um, will still have the legacy endpoint, but will just ensure that at that stage, we'll just uh, decommission the CMicro hardware. So if you are still using the uh, Kik Python Kiko client, so the Kiko client, which is in the Kiko workspace, uh, uh, but template in actual, uh, actual OpenShift, um, you, will you will be receiving um, um, an EC2 instance instead of the CMicro machine. Uh, worth knowing that uh, it's possible to have bare metal option, but through the new API only. And it was that option exists, will exist in August already, uh, if you want to explore the new API endpoint. And the legacy uh, CMicro hardware and the ARM64, which are uh, of ThunderX generation one uh, hardware will be um, sent to trash. The only uh, infra that will keep uh, um, in the local data center is PowerPC, uh, so eight and one PowerPC nine box. In the local cloud, which is in fact open Nebula because this is the easiest cloud solution that you can deploy uh, and everything is managed by Ansible. 
And phase three, which is end of the year, uh, will just shut down completely, uh, stop the service from Duffy for the API endpoint, and everything will be running in the new uh, mode. So just uh, hybrid cloud. So DBC64 on, on premises, and everything else is served from AC2 and available through a VPN tunnel up and running. One thing that we still don't have a full migration plan yet is OpenShift, but um, some people at the moment are looking at it uh, just to, to provide it and so help with Tunnet and come with some kind of migration plan to help you migrate from existing ocp.ci.centerlock OpenShift cluster to the new one, which normally would be named, but still to be um, uh, deployed OS for OpenShift, os.ci.centerlock, which we have to use a different cluster name unfortunately. And that's it for the plan. Um, if you have question, that would be the perfect time to ask the question. Just having a look in the Q&A. No question yet. Oh. Oh, probably. Okay, so David, just, just, yeah, I don't see any question there, but probably because shown disconnect. So, just ask your question uh, here in the chat window, and we can answer the question. Uh, have we considered using IBM Cloud? Uh, no, because we don't have IBM support and sponsor accounts. So, no. Um, so for, uh, we'll still use local hardware that we have at our disposal uh, for PPC64 LE. Uh, S390X, we don't have access to that, so it's a no-go for that. Um, question two is, what's the relationship uh, between Duffy and testing, testing farm? Uh, it's really a good question. Uh, I was just aware of testing farm recently because testing farm were listed as a CI infra tenant in the past. So it seems that's something that started in parallel uh, and after uh, existing CI infra, uh, but they are using the same, um, well, apart from uh, the API endpoint, which will be different. And what we do, something that NIS was not covering, but if you are using the system, you know that you don't have to wait for a machine. If you ask the machine, you will get it directly because we just use a buffer pool. So the machine are always ready in a buffer pool ready to be uh, handed over to for CI test. Um, I don't know for testing farm, but I guess that under the hook that will be using AC2 instance. Um, the only difference is that here um, in our OpenShift, uh, if you are using the template that we provide in the CI OpenShift, uh, they, there is a specific Kiko workspace pod that's mounted with some secrets for the Duffy API key and uh, a specific SSH key for the test. Um, I don't think that this is something that they use in testing farm. I don't think they provide OpenShift either. Um, but even if one can eventually use the other, I guess, if it's open. Question for uh, the, from Fantisek. Um, I think that's that's to me. Like, uh, oh, well, well, to both of us. Like, uh, technically, um, the command line client is talking to the API, which is a just box standard uh, JSON to to a REST API endpoint thing. So you're free to do that as well. Yeah. So, uh, and when you mentioned going to be public, um, do you mean uh, from publicly available from outside? Because normally the plan was just to have available from inside because that's where OpenShift is. And uh, because we will have the VPN tunnel, uh, but we can eventually expose it outside. It's already uh, behind HTTPS even internally, because it's really something that we wanted to get rid of in the past for the legacy uh, Duffy code, which was running on HTTP plain text, which was, well, just internal, but on port 8080. So this one is really um, uh, uh, behind HTTPS. But yeah, if you don't want to use the Duffy CLI, and uh, myself initially, and Nils uh, can Remember that when we wanted to, to give it a try, I wrote a small bash wrapper with curl in 30 seconds to just let me test the infra when we were playing with the Ansible role to deploy Duffy. So everything is under Ansible control, Duffy itself and everything of, uh, in the infra for the, the move. Um, 
So it's up to you um, if you want to, to have the Duffy client installed or not. But what we'll do is as we add Kiko client, we'll have Duffy client installed in the base image for the Kiko workspace template in OpenShift uh, because it's needed. But people can also talk to the API directly if they want to. No other question? Oh, I think there is one eventually in the Q&A section now. Oh, these were the one from Davide, but already insert. So, which version of Postgres? Uh, it's the one from Rel eight. Uh, so I can eventually give you that information. Yeah, we, we we don't use any any fancy Postgres features, so it's probably compatible with quite some old versions of Postgres. Um, we use what, whatever was available, like you you mentioned on on. Uh, Relate centers eight. That's the version we we used in in wider testing. Uh, I used the one I had on my my local Fedora box. So, yeah, just a look, and it's uh, the one from EL eight is uh, Postgres ten the twenty one. So the module, but nothing really no needed feature from Postgres. I, yeah, I think the the the, the, the uh, most you could talk, talk about a feature that we use that not super super uh database standard is like we use a json field for st storing some of the not so structured data but that's about it if i guess that it's good to probably stop here because we started late but um if there are other questions happy both me and myself to answer question in the uh, all the way track so thanks a lot yeah thanks everybody for attending Thank you, Fabian and Niels. Uh, and our next talk uh, should be starting in in just two minutes. And I think um, I think everything's working correctly this time. So we'll see you there. Thanks. <laughs>